reading from Song of Songs. If you need a Bible, please raise your hand and one of the stewards will come and bring you one. <coughs> and if you're reading from a church Bible, the page is 681. Like an apple tree among the trees of the beloved among the young men, I delight to sit in his shade, and his fruit is sweet to my taste. Let him lead me to the bank of all, and let his banner over me be love. Strengthen me with raisins, refresh me with apples, for I am faint with love. His left arm is under my head, and his right arm embraces me. Daughters of Jerusalem, I charge you by the gazelles and by the does of the field. Do not arouse or awaken love until it so desires. Listen, my beloved, look, here he comes, leading across the mountains, bounding over the hills. My beloved is like a gazelle or a young stag. Look, there he stands behind our wall, gazing through the windows, peering through the lattice. My beloved spoke and said to me, Arise, my darling, my beautiful one, come with me. See, the winter is past. The rains are over and gone. Flowers appear on the earth. The season of singing has come. The cooing of doves is heard in our land. The fig tree forms its early fruit. The blossoming vines spread their fragrance. Arise, come, my darling, my beautiful one, come with me. My dove in the clefts of the rock, in the hiding place is sweet, and your face is lovely. Catch for us the foxes, the little foxes that ruin the vineyards our vineyards that are in bloom. My beloved is mine, and I am his. He browses among the lilies until the day breaks and the shadows flee. Turn, my beloved, and be like a gazelle or like a young stag on the rugged hills. Thank you very much, Alice. Um, <clears throat> please do keep that passage in front of you. Um, because hopefully many of the questions you have about what the little foxes are and the stag and the gazelle and all of that um, may be answered, hopefully, as we take a closer look at that passage. My name is Josh. I work for Christchurch Liverpool. Um, and I'm going to speak for a little while on that passage. There is a copy of what I'm going to say on the internet. Um, it's on our website. If you go to christchurchliverpool.org and go forward slash in the word transcript, you'll find it there. Also, a... Uh, uh, copy of what I'm going to say translated into Farsi. There's one. There's some copies at the side if you'd want to make your way and get one of those, uh, if that would be helpful. Um, but before I speak to us on that passage, I'm going to just take a moment and pray for God's help. So let's pray. <coughs> Our dear Father, we pray that the song that we think about now would be something that our hearts learn to resonate with, to sing ourselves. We pray that um, you would fill our mind, our vision this morning with the glory of Jesus Christ, that um, as we saw with the children's talk, that we would experience the sweetness, um, that we would be made into people who would share him with others because of our great joy and delight in him. Lord, we often don't feel like doing that, so we pray for your help. We pray for your help in uh, concentrating in understanding, um, but more than anything in steering our hearts towards love for Jesus. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, so this week, there's the first time, um, probably the first time of many times I'm going to hear over the next weeks and months, um, and you might have heard this too, first time I'm going to hear the evenings are getting lighter. Have you heard someone say that yet? Maybe, maybe that was you. Maybe that Maybe you've said some, that to someone. It's quite a British thing, isn't it? There's a kind of a rule. If you're not from the UK, you have to this rule, okay? The first thing is that the evenings get lighter. You've got to say it to someone. You've got to say, oh, the evening's getting lighter, you know. Um, it's, it's not one of those things that we need pointing out to us. We, we have all spotted it. But we love to say it. Um, it's not as if someone's saying, oh, well, that's what it is. The evening's getting lighter. I thought someone just had a really bright torch. But we say it, okay? We have to say it. Um, to let everyone else know that we've spotted the evenings are getting lighter because it is uh, a way to share our optimism and our hope with someone else. It's a way that we just express 
a little bit of our, our optimism, our gladness. It's like celebrating a little win. We spot the first signs of winter ending, and, and now might be a little bit early to do that. It's still January, but we've spotted that already. Someone pointed out to me some, some shoots of daffodils coming through in our garden. Uh, we spot, even now, we spot the little flowers that poke through the frost. We point out when evenings are still light at 5 p.m. We share with someone else when we get home in the light. Isn't that great? Has anyone done that yet? Gotten home in the light for the first time. It's great, isn't it? And we like to share that because we are just fed up with the cold and the darkness and nothing growing in the garden and the mushy leaves on the floor and the bare trees. So keep our eyes open to spot the sign uh, that wind, winter is ending because we can tell ourselves that things will get better. And the nice thing about that, and the reason why we're, we are full of optimism at that point, is because we certainly know that it definitely will, that winter will definitely end, and spring will certainly come, as surely as night follows day. We know exactly that spring will come. So this optimism and hope is one that we feel entitled to because we know it's true. Now, if you're a Christian, you could say that you have a hope, a bit like that, in Jesus. You look forward to a day that's different to today, a day where he comes again. And when he comes again, he'll put everything that's wrong. Right. He will end all the pain and suffering. There'll be no more news on the news that gets us depressed, the news of violence. And part of the Christian hope is that we know that he definitely will come. He said so. And so everyone here who's a Christian has that certain hope. That um, confidence that as surely as night follows day, as surely as Jesus will come. That is the hope we want to live in. But we all know the day to day, really, how we feel. We don't always long as much as we long for winter to be over. We get more excited at light evenings than we do about the prospect that Jesus is coming back. We, we just sort of, if you like, make a winter nest while we're waiting for him to come and sort of don't really, don't really look forward to it because we, we make ourselves as comfortable as we can now, such that the idea that he's coming again is just something that we can often say what well, we believe as part of our Christian faith. But our lives are not full of eager anticipation of him coming, like we are eagerly anticipating the spring. And I think Song of Songs, the book that was read, or part was read to Alice earlier, that is a great book to read if you want help with that kind of thing. It's not a book that you're going to read lots of facts and reasons and learn a lot in your head about all the reasons why Jesus is great. And then you go away and you say, that box, I've learned something new. I believe all the right things. Song of Songs. <coughs> is a song that we should sit back and enjoy and resonate with. Resonate's quite a good word, I think. Um, resonate is when uh, something is making a noise, like the ringing of a bell, and something else that has the same frequency is kind of started off by that original noise. So the original noise causes something else that's like-minded to also join in with the song. Song of Songs is meant to do that to us. We should tune ourselves to resonate with this song, get caught up in it. And if we let it, it will stir a song in us of delight and longing for the beloved man that we read about in, us, in the song. And it will kindle in us that thing we're struggling with, a warmth towards Jesus, a delight, an appetite, and a hope that we can't, we can't help but express, just like we share with others, how excited we are that it was life at home. And that's going on in our passage today. Our passage today is a passage that is full of anticipation and happy hope. One big thing in the whole section, and I'm really going to be looking at verses 8 to 17. We had the context of it read earlier, verses 3 to 17, but we're going to start really at verse 8. We'd like to know a little bit about verses 3 to 7. Um, you can go on the website and hear last week's sermon. Um, but um, from verse 8, we're going to look at the passage, and one big uh, theme that will help us get 
stuck into the passage, make sense of it, is this theme. A theme that spring <coughs> is coming. Spring is coming. So as we read uh, this part of the Song of Songs, let me just fill you in on how we can best understand this song. Um, the whole of this book is one long continuous song and there's two main singers. The man and the woman. And the whole song, no matter where you dip into it, is likely to be them expressing their feelings of love. And it's during a period of their courtship, if you like, which is a bit of an old fashioned word that means uh, they're not married. They are um, dating, perhaps. But it seems that these two have got a definite commitment in mind that they will get married one day in the future. And what we find when we read Song of Songs and as we look into these verses today is a picture of the ideal. It's very romantic. It's not, it's not based on a real, historic, live couple of people. It's not a real-life experience of those two people, but it's almost like a play that sets before us a picture of the most beautiful and romantic and intoxicating and enthralling romance. And we've got it in the Bible, so that as we read it, we'll begin to understand, firstly, how love between a man and a woman should pursue this intimate purity. But also as we read it, to, uh, well, it was written for the original readers, people to read, and it will remind them of how much God loves them. How the, sat- the desires that we have for human relationships are found in God. And God is um, pictured like the man in the song. He's got a deep and passionate and yearning love. And we are like the woman. And if all was well... We would be enjoying the fullness of God's tender love and his flourishing creation. The intense and love between the man and the woman in the garden is how God created humankind to be, without shame, in his perfect garden of creation. And we find our deepest appetite satisfied in walking with him. So, let's have a look. Verse 8. Um, this passage begins with the woman up in, let's say, she's probably inside in her bedroom. Imagine it a bit like Romeo, Romeo, uh, wherefore art thou Romeo situation. This beautiful young woman is stood on her Juliet balcony, gazing out from her room window. And then verse 8, she sees her beloved. and He's coming towards her. They're going to have this um, uh, an exciting special rendezvous. He's on his way. She sees him in the distance. He's on his way. And her heart begins to race. It's like that happy, nervous feeling that you might have felt when you were young and you're at the school disco and there was someone there you fancied. That kind of little fluttering in your, in your insides. And that, even that happy nervousness when you think they've got their eye on you too. She's nervous, she's excited, she's full of anticipation. And it seems that they, we can understand the whole of the rest of this passage, verses 8 to 17, as um, her... Envisaging uh, meeting up is going to go. From what she knows about him, she's able to kind of rehearse how this is going to go. She sees him coming from afar. She describes him like a stag. He's strong, he's nimble, he's graceful, and he's leaping across the mountains so that he can be with her. He arrives, but he's outside that, the gate. They're, they're not face to face yet. He's, he's outside the gate. He can see through the gate, he can see her, her window, and she describes in verse 10 how he calls to her, and he invites her out. And we begin to see from the words that he invites her out with, that with the arrival of this wonderful man comes spring. He invites her out of her small, dark, wintry room and outdoors of his arrival. He says to her, see, the winter is past. And he describes four ways that she can enjoy the beautiful springtime. It's all picture language. Um, And I'm not going to kind of decode it. I just want you to to get the feel of of the picture, the beauty of it. Notice how how this is beautiful. He says, firstly, the rains are gone kind of hunker down against the elements, hide away and cover up. He's inviting her into the freshness and warmth and freedom. Secondly, he says that there's flowers appearing on the earth. 
So he's inviting her into this beautiful garden, the garden that's in bloom, echoes of the very first Garden of Eden, the way man and woman were created to enjoy God's good creation. They would have enjoyed the luscious, beautiful, fragrant and colourful delights of the garden. Third, he says, the season of singing has come. The cooing of doves is heard in our land. There's the sounds. It's very immersive, isn't it? You see the sights and the smells and now the sounds. And the sounds are sounds of delight, sounds of joy, sounds of singing. And probably sounds of safety. There's nothing to disturb those birds. Come out and enjoy this delightful smell, sight, sounds and safety. And the fourth thing, in verse 13, he says, the fig tree forms its early fruit. The blossoming vines spread their fragrance. So it's, it's fruitful as well. He invites her out into the springtime of his coming, and it's fruitful. It's tasty. It's satisfying. And this part of the song tells us that the beloved man in the song is a man who brings with him spring. And she is describing how when he arrives, there's delight and the way she expresses the, the way that this delight captures every bit of her senses in his arrival is she puts it in the picture language of freshness and freedom and warmth and sunshine after rain and fragrance and colour, joy, singing and safety. That's the feeling that she experiences when her beloved man arrives. And you can't quite express that only in song, only with pictures, only with the experience. Your senses stimulated by beautiful garden, beautiful colours of springtime. To feel like somebody's presence in your life, like spring arriving, is quite a rare thing. Maybe you've not experienced that. Maybe you feel like you have experienced that. But it is the kind of longing that we are made for. We are made for a relationship like that. We are made for a relationship where someone just arrives at our gate and it feels like spring is here. Everything turns. Everything changes color. Everything is fresh and full and free and safe. In the Bible, uh, the song is here in the Bible because we are meant to long for somebody like that. And the first readers of this, when they were written, they'd have picked up that this relationship uh, that they are longing for. This relationship that changes winter into spring is actually the relationship between God and his people. But this isn't information about God. This is a song to, to stir their hearts, to paint it into full colour. The fact that God loves them. He's outside their gate. He's waiting in tender love and he's saying to his people, arise, my darling, my beautiful one. Come with me. And as the people who first read this begin to, to dwell on that and get that, they, they'll start to grow in anticipation of his promises to restore everything that's broken. Grow more uneasy with the winter time we live in and more hopeful of what God's going to do. And for us today, it does the same kind of thing. We get to immerse ourselves in the sights and the smells and the sounds and the feels and the tastes of these words of hope and bloom and fragrance. And we can almost taste and smell the future that we know that Jesus promises us. The, the first signs of spring when you're walking in the park, the lighter evenings, our senses are meant to remind us that we are longing for a better time, for pain to be healed, for hurt to stop. And, in, and we long for that in ways that we can't quite we are meant to long for the coming of the beloved man. When we are meant to rehearse to ourselves, like the woman in the song, what it will be like when he arrives. Or what it will be like when, when night turns to day, when winter turns to spring. We're meant to imagine that. Imagine that being invited to the warmth of paradise. Fresh, free, warm, sweet smelling, fruitful, filled with joyful sound of singing. Now, if that is all that this passage is doing for us, then we would be in danger, or maybe we think like this ourselves already, in danger of thinking that we love Jesus because of what he offers us, because of a nicer life he brings us into. We would hope that Jesus comes back because we want what he brings, rather than loving him himself. 
And this could be twisted as if the eager young bride-to-be is waiting in her bedroom for like anybody who's going to turn winter into spring. But it's not like that in this passage. And that's the other big thing, the big theme in this part of the song. And that is that love is calling. Love is calling. There's a theme in a lot of romantic movies, not that I've watched them all, um, but there's a theme I think you'll probably recognize from romantic movies, where partway through, maybe two thirds or three quarters of the way through the movie, the relationship between the two main characters breaks down. Maybe one of them uh, has walked away to pursue the dream they always had. Maybe they've stormed off from the relationship uh, and said, I want to pursue my dream. You're holding me back. I want to pursue that, that, the, the travel or the job that I always wanted. I'm going to take the promotion, even if that ruins the relationship, because I've got to do what's right for me here. Or they, they move away because they've got the college application. If you're watching a high school kind of one, their college application has been accepted and they're going to move away. Um, I think of a scene in Shrek, which I know maybe not every scene, um, but if you have, then, then you'll remember. There's a montage where the princess who's been locked away all her life in a tower, she's longed for someone to rescue her and to marry a king or a prince and be dressed in a white wedding dress and live in a castle all her life. And she gets it. She does get it. But there's a montage that shows how She's sitting in her wedding dress. She's at the table with the king. She has all she wants, except she's unhappy. Because that's the thing in these romantic movies. When the person gets all that they want, the life that they want, they're still unhappy because in these stories, they're unhappy because they can't share it with the one they really love. All their dreams come true, but it's just empty because they're not with the one they love. And now we could give a modern day critique whether that is right or wrong or not. But in this relationship here, In the Song of Songs, spring is coming, spring is described, but that dreams come true, but it's no use until she's with him. The highlight of this part of the song isn't that winter turns to spring. The true delight in this part of the song is the tender love now that the beloved man has arrived. She's seen him on uh, his way to her house. He's there waiting at the gate, and and she's talking about him. She's gushing about him as if the flowers are blooming beneath his feet. But the real weight of feeling in this song is how delighted they are at each other. For verse 14, um, the man's still outside the gate. And we don't know if this is a part where the woman is still talking about what he's saying or whether it's actually what what he's saying. Uh, But having invited her out into the springtime, he still can't see her. So he's, he's made his invitation at the gate. No sign of her. He can't see her face at the window. And so he calls out in verse 14, likening her to a dove hiding between the rocks on a mountainside. And his call to her this time is not to invite her into the thing he's got to offer, but his call to her is because he wants to delight in her. My dove in the clefts of the rock in the hiding places on the mountainside. Show me your face. Let me hear your voice. For your voice is sweet and your face is lovely. Here is a point in the song where we see that the true joy of spring isn't the warmth and the flowers, but who you spend it with. He's delighting in her. Sparks are going to fly, not because of the flowers, but because he loves her and she loves him. She answers him in verse 16, a sigh of secure delight. My beloved is mine and I am his. That's the real climax. Love has come calling. She belongs to him. He is hers. He delights in her. Her anticipation at the beloved's arrival, this eagerness she's been feeling, isn't because he comes and makes things better, but because He is him, and he is hers, and she is his, and they're in love. Verse 15 is a weird one, Uh, foxes, Um, but I think that speaks of the security of this relationship. The future that they envisage together when they say verse 15 is, is one where they've sorted out issues that might threaten this beautiful relationship. The high point they're never going to come down from. 
Um, I take it they're using the idea of a vineyard in the whole song. Vineyard or a garden is kind of a metaphor for the relationship between the man and the woman. And the idea of getting rid of the foxes, it does tell us in verse 15 that foxes are a problem because they ruin the vineyard. So um, this means that they're catching anything that will ruin the vineyard. They're going to catch the snags, the problems, the, the issues, the ironing it all out because they want to know that the future is secure. This high point reached, they're never going to come down from. The foxes are caught. There's going to be no threats. From here on out, it's just rest and security. And again, the first readers of this passage in the Old Testament would have seen that this is describing the hope stepping into the world and bringing his kingdom. But I wonder whether they have had a lot of hope in the, the material kingdom he'll bring. And this passage is really great to point them to the fact that it's not that they are looking forward to all the goodness that they're going to have when God comes, but they're going to have God. This is speaking of their delight in the fact that it will one day be their experience, what God has already told them. He said to them already, you will be my people and I will be your God. That's a joyful phrase. We just don't get that until we get it in a song. Pick up how wonderful that is until we see it between a man and a woman reflected. I am yours and, and he is mine. Oh, that's what it is. And again, as Christians, this song stirs in our hearts, not just some um, anticipation in our mind of knowing Jesus is coming and he'll make things right. But this is pointing out to us, actually, he is there saying, show me your face for your face is lovely. Jesus hasn't promised you that he'll come back because he's going to fix the winters. He's promised you he'll come back because he, he wants to see your face and take delight in you. He wants to hear your voice because your voice is sweet. Do you know that that is Jesus' posture towards you today? That's how he's looking at you today. If you've had a miserable week, if you have done things you regret, if you've done things you're ashamed to admit to anyone and they don't know it, if you feel like a total failure, even if you're not a Christian today, you're here, you're listening, uh, but you feel maybe this isn't quite you because you can't quite resonate with this. You're far off from God. Well, you know what? Jesus is posture towards you is saying, let me see your face. I love it. Let me hear your voice. I love it. I love you. I take delight in you. As a church, we've, we wanted to do more things this academic help people in their devotional lives. And sometimes the words devotional life just stir up inside us feelings of guilt. Because um, we imagine that what we've got to do is spend 10 minutes a day reading through the Bible, pray for those things on the list. And if we are doing it, we think we're doing well. How are you doing? I'm doing well. I've had all my devotions this week. I'm doing well if I do it. And if we don't, well, where am I with God? You know, I haven't spent 10 minutes every day this week having a devotional time with God. That's, that's just not this, is it? <laughs> that's not this passage. Don't spend 10 minutes in the morning fending off guilt because we told you to. What we mean is Jesus is there outside the gate saying, I, I love you. I love your voice. I love your face. And what we want to do with our devotion lives is just to say, get that. Just don't miss that. Spend time in that with a Jesus who, who loves you, who's delighting in you. Even if you'd say you've been rubbish at following him, well, he just loves you anyway. We're not earning points in having quiet times. That's the whole point, because he loves you. He just, he loves you. That's what it is, a devotional time. It's going and knowing that he loves you. Whatever great things you did do this week, or whatever great things you didn't manage to do, don't let those things form what you think Jesus thinks of you. Whatever good things you did this week, or whatever thing, good things you didn't manage to do, don't let those things form what you think Jesus thinks of you. Let the Bible form what you think Jesus thinks of you. Show me your face. Let me hear your voice. For your voice is sweet and your face is lovely. He's a lover bounding over the hills. He loves you. Love is calling. 
So the final thing is this. Um, wait in a hurry. Wait in a hurry. Um, what does this mean? I think we often have a different idea to the Bible of what it means to wait patiently. This whole passage is the woman anticipating. She's, she's waiting. And we think that it's good behavior to wait patiently. So think of a child. It's time for pudding. Um, and it's ice cream for pudding. And um, you're just waiting for the ice cream that you've taken out of the freezer to soften up. So you can't quite serve it yet. You'll bend your spoon. So you just need to give it 10 minutes to soften up. And then you scoop it into the bowls and give it to the children. Now, one of your children is hopping down. They're saying, can I have my ice cream? Is it ready yet? It's there. I can see it. Can I have it yet? Can I have it yet? Please, can I have it? Uh, and they're just hopping up and down. They, they start picking which sauce they're going to have on top. I'm going to have the chocolate sauce. No, no, no. I'm going to have the raspberry sauce. I'm going to have both. Then their imagination kicks in. Oh, can I have sprinkles? Do we have any? Oh, can I have it in a cone? Is it ready yet? The other child, well, they're waiting patiently. Thank you very much. They're sitting still. Their hands are folded. And they're just humming away. We think sitting still and being quiet is waiting patiently. <laughs> if we've got any sense from this morning that, that Jesus is coming and it will be joyous and perfectly soul satisfying, then the typically British response, and I know many of you aren't British, but this is what you'll see us doing, is just internalizing that. Jesus is good. Oh, yeah. And then we wait patiently, quietly. That's not what the Bible says waiting is like. We wait in a hurry. Let's take our lead from the woman. She's doing the right kind of waiting. Let's let her song resonate and stir our song. She's eager. She's restless. She's watching out of the window to see him in the distance, leaping over the hills. He's not even here yet, but she's eager. She's watching. She's in a hurry. She's not in a panic. This. She's, but she's not doing what we would call patiently waiting. She gets carried away. By her imagination, as she rehearses what her lover is going to say. And she's not saying that in a sort of naive, unrealistic hope that she's making up. But she, this is a true and certain happy hope because of what she knows to be true about him. She knows it's true that in his presence, flowers bloom and vines blossom. And so in her happy hope, she can't contain herself. She sings. She calls others to listen. She shares her hope with whoever will listen. And she calls in verse 17. She calls out to him, run like a gazelle. I don't know if that's going to make him come quicker now that she said, be like a gazelle. But that's the thing. She's in a hurry. She's waiting in eager anticipation. And so what I mean is that we can let this song kindle in us a sort of a hurry for Jesus. That when you get the chance, you're going to join in with this. You're going to sing of his goodness when you get the chance to. You're going to want to come along so that you can sing because that's it's not really speeding it up, but it is like calling out. Come like a gazelle. Chat about Jesus. Just go on about him. You love about him. Fill your imagination with the hopes of what Jesus has said he will do when he comes back. Let yourself smell. Taste the taste and feel the warmth and deepen your love. Let signs like spring be a tangible reminder that you can sense that's meant to intensify your appetite. And pray in a hurry. Pray that he comes soon. Call him. That's what's going on with the, the communities, the missions that we going on that we heard about this morning and why we think it's important as a church that we invest in those that we engage in those we hear about those and pray for them because people on those kind of missions um, mission Cade and folks who are doing summer camps and going to Lebanon they're living like this they're waiting in a hurry they know Jesus is coming soon they, they've seen the first signs of spring they know that there's nothing else that's that needs to happen in order for him to come but, so they're sharing with others what their hope is. They're calling out to other people in Lebanon and, and Cumbria, saying, listen, the beloved is coming. I just want to tell you how great he is. They've heard Jesus' words that the rains are ending, the flowers are blooming, the birds are singing, the fruit is ripening, and they know that he delights in them. They're not trying to earn any points. It's from that security, the safety the foxes have been caught. Nothing is between them and Jesus anymore. 
Well, that's why we want to go out and invite others into this too. I want us to resonate with this song as well. Hearts to be lifted by the hope of the winter. And the hope that we have it, it, that in Jesus, well, life will be one day restored to what it should be, a perfect garden. But even more so, I want our hearts to be lifted to sing in the knowledge that my beloved is mine and I am his. And that is the deepest longing that we were made for. And having it satisfied is right there in front of us in Jesus. So maybe next time that someone points out to you, maybe this week, maybe over the next 10, 12 weeks, every time someone points out to you that those evenings are getting lighter, remember that this is the longing you have for winter to be over. And that this tantalizing feeling that's presented to our senses reminds us that an even better spring is coming. And even better than that, love is calling.